this month, twice a month meeting. You know, we had one two weeks ago. I have some uh, announcements of other things to do. The, the most important is, I mentioned to those of you who were here last time that had an interest in, the, in seeing the leadership of this group expand some. And we introduced uh, Betty Conley as uh, vice president the other day. Could not introduce the other, the, the other new vice president because she was in Las Vegas at the time. But Helen Wilson, please stand. Is our, uh, Helen's going to come up and make a couple of comments. But you should know if you don't recognize the name that Helen has become the, the scribe of Squirrel Hill. If you read the uh, Squirrel Hill news, Helen has been writing now a, a monthly, a quarterly column on items of interest in Squirrel Hill. They're really fascinating. You make sure, make sure and read them. Helen? The spotlight's here. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll just stand here. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to working with Michael. I've, I've worked with him now for the past year or two. And anyway, um, I do have three announcements. First one is, I did forget to bring the poster, but Mary S. Brown's Ukrainian Easter egg sale is next Saturday from 11 until 5. And the eggs are made by members of the congregation, um, and they're gorgeous. So um, if you don't know where okay, Mary so S. Brown is, now we have the first one on. or you want that one Boulevard, on? between the busy section between Browns Hill Road and... Okay. Um, All right. The parkway entrance. The, the church just needs right to read a script. So anyway, that's next Saturday. Second is that um, not this coming Squirrel Hill magazine issue, but the next one and the next one. I'm, I'm planning to focus on the Civil War in Squirrel Hill, how it affected Squirrel Hill. So if you have any personal stories of um, your your ancestors, I've already gotten a few fascinating ones. Um, if you'd like this to submit them to me, I'd like them either in writing or via email. And you can email them to the Squirrel Hill Historical Society, and they'll forward them to me. Or you can type them out or write them out and bring them to the next meeting. But um, I'm focusing on the people who were in Squirrel Hill and who were probably either willingly or unwillingly called up to service, and then there's always a fourth lap to talk about and some other things. So if you have any personal stories, um, one person just told me about her ancestor's hair being frozen to the battlefield um, as he lay there overnight. So stories like that are very interesting. And the third thing is we're going to request for a picture of an old picture of the golf station on that was on Forbes and Murray. And I couldn't find it on historicpittsburgh.com. So if any of you know of or have a picture of the old golf station, um, contact us. Um, this gentleman is very eager to have a copy. So, um, Thank you. yes. I just say that I've been collecting the decorated Easter eggs. I don't know about this particular woman that I've collected them for years and they're incredible. So it's worth going to take Thank a look you. and see. There's, there's a whole range of prices and, um, you know, they, they yeah. price them for they last, you. If you leave the cupboard door open, it's <coughs> there. I've had them for years. Thank you, because they are great. They are. It's wonderful work. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Helen. Welcome for the leadership team. Um, last time we were here, we had a very big crowd. There was some commentary. Uh, from the back of this substantially larger room than we had with the other church. And I'm happy to announce that today the Historical Society has bought its first sound system. And we will have that set up for the next meeting in order so that it's possible to hear in the corners of this room, you know, what's going on in the meeting. So um, we, we look forward to introducing that to you next time. Events. Walking tour, June 11th. The slips are back there. I'm starting to get sign-ups. Three dollars for members, five for non-members. We're doing with the Pittsburgh Park Conservancy, 10 to about 12. Frick Park. The odds are 95% will be meeting at the Frick Park Na Nature Center. Anyone who signs up, I will call in advance to remind you to come and tell you exactly where it is. But uh, at some point, 
not yet. We'll be cutting off. We don't want too big a group. So those who are interested, nice Saturday morning in June, please join us. Um, membership, we're near a record membership for the year. I want to get over it. Uh, there are a few people around still who have renewed. We're proud of our renewal rate. We're over 80% already this year. I think we were 90 last year. And I'm ambitious enough to want to keep that up. <coughs> Meetings, programs. Uh, I'll introduce our speaker in just a moment, but let me just go over four programs quickly with you. Next week, uh, next month, May 10th, Al Mann, who we've heard before, he's the uh, president of the East End East Liberty Historical Society, and he talked to us about his area. He's coming back, he's also a member now here. He was a chem uh, energy engineer throughout his life, and he's going to talk about early petroleum pioneers in the East End which will be twinned with a program I'm working on for next year to talk about the origins of and the current status of Marcella Shale, because I think it's something that uh, is of interest to us. In, um, on June 14th, we'll have a speaker on the Jewish uh, Genealogical Society of Pittsburgh to talk about researching genealogy. And then in July, uh, a woman who's gotten quite a bit of publicity, the professor at Pitt, will talk, uh, Kathleen Parker, will talk to us about the history of the Unitarian Universalist Church. Now, just a first announcement. In September, and none of this is written yet, Sala Udman, the former city councilman, is going to come and speak to us about personal memories of August Wilson, who was a lifetime friend of Pitt's. So I did that was just set up today and I'm very excited about that happening. I'm trying to get an additional theater program for the year so we you know, can look at the more general development of theater in Pittsburgh. The rest of the program is uh, in development. If I get busy, if you have any ideas, talk to Helen, let her know about them uh, as we begin to build our program. Program tonight, Rainy Clark who lives in Somerset, is one of our neighbors now, after living in the North Hills, or the North Shore for a long time. Renee is, a, as it says, Vice Chancellor for Community Initiatives at Pitt, after a career in Westinghouse. This is an important program for me, because I've tried for six or eight years to have someone talk to us about Pitt. And when you're as big as Pitt, it's hard to find the right person to come and talk, but we have, and I welcome Rainey to the stand. Michael. Now, Ralph and I haven't practiced this, so if uh, we get out of sync, I'll just have to say, hang on a minute, we'll get back in sync. But uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. I really do appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects, the University of Pittsburgh. So every time I'm pointing at him, I'm not being rude, he needs to put the next slide. As Michael said, uh, I came to Pitt uh, in 2000 after a 34-year career with the Westinghouse Electric Corporation. Now, I know you all are historical buffs, so I will give you a little idea of history. I was the last official employee of the old Westinghouse Electric Corporation. Now, some of the folks moved on when they became CBS Broadcasting and went to New York City. But until they got me retired, they could not totally shut down the Westinghouse Electric Corporation. And the way I found that out, a few months after I retired in April of 2000, I got a phone call from a friend of mine in New York City who was, had gone up there to be part of this uh, CBS Westinghouse Broadcasting merger. And Chuck said, hey, Ray, we just were going back through the retiree records because in order to complete all the transactions, there had to be a verification that there were no more eligible retirees for the Westinghouse pension plan. And he said, when your retirement papers came in, we were able to then go to the court and say, the last person eligible for retirement from Westinghouse Electric Corporation has signed his papers, and it's here. He said, but we stumbled on something very interesting. He, think, he said, I think you enjoy knowing. The first retiree of the Westinghouse Electric Corporation was George Westinghouse. <laughs> the last retiree of the Westinghouse Electric Corporation, about 254,000 
retirees over the course of the 120 years, 20, 115 years of corporation. The last official retiree is G. Reynolds Clark. <laughs> so that took away a little bit of the pain of walking out the door because I literally sold the Westinghouse building in the downtown, which is now known as 11th Stanwood Street, as an office building. But I literally sold it, turned the keys over to the new building owner, and walked out the door on April 28, 2000. At that time, the chancellor <clears throat> asked me if I would uh, come out to the University of Pittsburgh to help him set up a function called Community and Governmental Relations. And so I talked my wife into letting me go back for a couple years, go back to work for a couple years. So it'll be 11 this August. Now, one good friend here is Steve Zupsick. Uh, he it works in the community relations office at the university, and I know he had he was a member of the pool that they had, the lottery, when I first came there, saying, how long will this turkey last? <laughs> now, my understanding, Steve had six months, so he lost his money early on. But Steve and I have worked together on a number of initiatives. Uh, he takes the lead with our faculty and staff volunteer uh, program that we do in a lot of things, uh, not only in Oakland, but throughout the city of Pittsburgh. So. Today, my role is uh, Vice Chancellor of uh, Community Affairs and the Chief of Staff. Now, I joined the university at a particularly exciting time, and uh, over the past 16 years has been the tenure of Chancellor Martin Nordenberg. And the university has made incredible progress, and we continue to build momentum in virtually everything that we do. And I'm going to just uh, give you some examples of our uh, progress and how we've been, especially in undergraduate edu education. Next one. Applications for our undergraduate programs have nearly tripled in the last 15 years. Now, when you think about that, nearly tripled. We usually have about 33, 3,400 openings in the freshman class. So back in 1995, your chances were one out of two that you were going to be accepted at the University of Pittsburgh. Today, your chances are more like one out of seven that you're going to be accepted at the University of Pittsburgh. So it's much more difficult to get in, and you'll see why. Next slide, please. The average SAT today to get into Pitt is 1,273. And we have a number of students that come in with 1,600 SATs. And as you can see the credentials, 51% of the freshman class this year, they're just completing their freshman year, were in the top 10% of their class. And 78% of the freshman class this year were in the top 20% of the class. So we have very impressive records of academic achievement. And these students perform at very, very high levels. Just to give you one example, for the third time in the last five years, an undergraduate was named a Rhodes Scholar, which further cements our position as one of the country's top producers of high achieving students. Since only 32 Rhodes Scholars are selected annually from among the very best students in the country's best universities, this is truly a noteworthy accomplishment. In fact, only three other public universities can equal that five-year record. That would be Florida State, North Carolina, and UCLA. And it's been my privilege to know each one of these three outstanding students and the work that they did. But Pitt's full of students who are special in a broad number of ways. And let me give you some three examples of some very recent forms of recognition for our students. Richard, Richard Kyle, a third-year law student, has been named a Robert Bosch Foundation Fellow. The Bosch Foundation is designed to enhance German-American relations and transatlantic understandings. Richard was just one of 20 fellows chosen from more than 600 applicants, and will spend next year in Germany working on commercial legal reform and international dispute resolution. The next slide, please. Paulina Gonzalez and James Spears are both undergraduates in our School of Arts and Sciences, and they've been chosen to receive a 2011 Woodrow Wilson Rockefeller Brothers Fund, uh, Fund Fellowship for Aspiring Teachers of Color. These fellowships help, help fund the completion of a master's <laughs> degree in education, preparation to teach in a uh, high-need public school, and a three-year teaching assignment. This was the first year that Pitt was actually uh, invited to nominate candidates. And Paulina and James won two of just the 25 fellowships that were awarded nationally. Next one, please. Wen Xu, a junior in our Honors College and uh, from the North Hills of Pittsburgh, she's from North Allegheny High School, has been named a 2011 Barry M. Goldwater Scholarship winner 
for her exceptional independent research. And she is now one of 35 students over the last 15 years that have won Goldwater scholarships. Again, a very high competitive process. Next slide, please. Now, beyond these award-winning award winners, there are countless University of Pittsburgh students who are producing prize-winning performances every day as they engage in a broad range of activities that, that add richness to their experiences and contribute to their overall growth. One of the things about the University of Pittsburgh and the undergraduate education experience is they relate to teachers and, and professors and researchers who are actually doing research work. So many, many of our undergraduate students are engaged in research while they are still working on their bachelor's degree. And that it, it definitely helps them as they move forward in their professional and academic careers. Why is this so important and why to our undergraduate education? Well, for example, during the last 16 years, our annual research expenditures have more than tripled, going from 240 million in 1995 to more than 700, and, next slide, 240 in 1995, next one please, to $737 million in research last year. That's in one year. Those are $737 million of funding that comes, most of it comes from outside the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And what that really does is not only provides the research, research base for the work that we do at the university, but literally provides a lot of jobs. Next slide, please. Pointing out that the 654 in, uh, in uh, last year, next slide, to 237, Next slide, please, is an increase of 13% in one year. Now, when you think about what year that took place in, that was this past year, when the economy has been such a difficult experience for most of us. The university has been able to attract funding like this. And these research dollars not only fund, next slide, please, the pioneering work, but they are a recognized sign of institutional strength and support a large number of local jobs. There's a standard convection that's used that says 36 jobs are generated, directly or indirectly, by every million dollars of research that goes to a research university. So that's close to 737 provides, a million provides nearly uh, over 26,000 jobs, directly and indirectly here in southwestern Pennsylvania. And again, this is in an economy when times have been really tough. Over the last 15 years, and you've heard this phrase, the eds and the meds, the educational and medical institutions of southwestern Pennsylvania have been the only job sector where there has been growth. And in fact, last year, there were over 1,000 new jobs created in the education and medical sector here in southwestern Pennsylvania. So the economic impact of the University of Pittsburgh is significant. We are the second largest employer in southwestern Pennsylvania. Now, many of you old-timers in the room can remember that that would have, wouldn't have been the case many, many years ago when we had the Westinghouses, the U.S. Steels, the U.S. Airs, the Gulf Oils, the Alcoas. But today, <clears throat> UPMC Health Systems is the largest employer, and the University of Pittsburgh is the second largest employer. Now, some of you also may not understand that UPMC is not part of the University of Pittsburgh. It is a standalone not-for-profit entity providing medical uh, services and medical research to the Western Pennsylvania community. UPMC and Pitt were separated back in 1998. That was at a time when there were a lot of lawsuits going on after uh, research universities, especially those that had large medical uh, complexes, and through medical malpractice, they were going through medical malpractice cases through the uh, health, service, health system to the endowments of the major university. And so the decision was made for Pitt and UPMC to become two separate entities. The only common bond is we share 12 directors. There are 12 directors that are common to the University of Pittsburgh board and 12 directors that are common to the UPMC board. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so with all that funding coming in, it should be no surprise to anyone that Pitt now ranks as one of the nation's top five universities, private or public, in terms of research grants competitively won by members of the faculty from the National Institutes of Health. Joining Harvard, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Penn over in Philadelphia, 
than the University of California at San Francisco. Ten years ago, Pitt would not have been in the top 50. When you think about that, ten years ago, Pitt would not have been in the top 50 in that number. Today, because of the collaborative research that's done at the University of Pittsburgh and at UPMC, together has drawn this funding to come to Pittsburgh. And we benefited from it in, in direct and indirect ways. I'll give you a very personal story on a direct way. Several years ago, I had surgery for thyroid cancer in, in, in the throat area. You can still see I have a little gravelly throat today yet. You said it will never go away, but you just learn to live with it. But I contracted a very serious blood infection as a result of the medical treatment. The man who came to treat me was doing experimental research with an NIH grant on the infection that I had. He was very blunt to my wife. And I'm laying in the hospital at Shadyside, and she's sitting in a chair, and he says to her, Mrs. Clark, we'll know in the next 24 hours if he's going to survive. But she said, but he said, I'm pretty sure he'll be okay. But I do want you to know, if this would have happened 100 or 200 miles away, at a regional hospital. He wouldn't have made it. And it's because Dr. Weber was doing this research, specifically on what I contracted through an NIH grant, that I, still, I really feel that I'm here today. So now we rank in the, among the top 10 universities in total research, including NIH grants, federal science and engineering research and development support. And the other universities in that top, top 10 are Johns Hopkins, Washington, Michigan, Penn, UCLA, Duke, the University of California, San Diego, the University of California, San Francisco, and Harvard. Now, again, I'll reflect <coughs> back on a personal experience of mine. When I was graduating from high school in 1961, you applied to all the schools that you wanted to go to, then you applied to the pit just in case. Some of you remember that? Yeah. Some of you remember that scenario? <laughs> Just in case you didn't get accepted someplace else, you go to Pitt. Well, the tables have really turned. And a lot of it is because of the outstanding faculty and researchers that we have that teach our students. Students now sort us out. It's not uncommon for a student to come to the admissions office and sit down with the admissions counselor and sit there and say, I'm considering Harvard, Stanford, MIT, and Pitt. And when you think about that comparison, that's pretty impressive. That's us here in Pittsburgh being compared to these incredible institutions across the country. Next slide, please. And that shows the ranking of the National Science Foundation through uh, 2007 in our ranking in 10th place. Next one, please. Another area that Pitt was recognized last year as the country's top public research university in a survey that was called Saviors of Our Cities. And this is an independent survey that's done across all public and private universities that reside within an urban environment across the country. And Pitt was ranked the number one public research university for its outreach efforts that help build regional economic strength and add vibrancy to the local community. There's another study being done by that same group of uh, researchers right now, and they're called, they're looking at what they call the metroversities, the universities that drive the economy of metropolitan regions. And while they haven't come out with their final rankings yet, I know where Pitt ends up. And we end up eighth, which is outstanding because we are the 24th largest metropolitan region in the United States. And we end up eighth. Now, I'm not allowed to tell you who we're ahead of and who we're behind, but the big ones you can think of. But uh, it's going to be a remarkable, when that report comes out, we're going to be, it's a remarkable achievement uh, for the university to be recognized. And it's through a lot of the efforts, not because I head up community initiatives, but, and I don't want to embarrass them, it's because of people like Steve and Gwen Watkins and John Wiles and Eli Shorak, and the list goes on and on of people who work with me at Pitt to reach out in the community in so many different ways to help make Oakland and the Pittsburgh area a better place. And we're constantly trying to make improvements as, as we can. Next slide, please. We're also recognized as one of the country's best places for bi biomedical researchers to work. These researchers are saying, come to Pitt. 
because they have the facilities, they have the administrative uh, perspective on why it's important to be doing research, and they really make the connections with the opportunities that we offer them here in Pitt. And we're one of the best places for people over 50 to work. And you're looking at a guy who's 68 years old who said I was only going to go to Pitt for two years. Now, if my wife were here tonight, she'd be raising her hand saying, when are you going to retire? When are you going to retire? <laughs> but I figure as long as you're having fun, you keep moving on. Next slide, please. We're also recognized as one of the um, most veteran-friendly students and one of the country's top ten universities in terms of happy students. Now, that might seem to be like a trivial survey, but it is very important because students vote with their feet today. If they aren't happy with an academic experience that they're currently enrolled in, they'll transfer. And today, college credits are so transferable all across the country, you want to make sure your students are happy. And that doesn't mean they're goofing off. We have a program called Outside the Classroom Curriculum, where the students have to do a significant amount of outside the classroom community work in order to have the uh, honor of wearing a green robe, a green robe on their graduation day. The first year we implemented that, we thought none of the seniors would qualify. Maybe a few of the juniors in the senior year would qualify. We were amazed at the number of seniors who really worked hard all year so they qualified to wear the green robe on graduation day. Because it said to them, not only did I come to Pitt get an education, but I came to Pitt to become part of the community and to serve the community, and I wanted to earn that recognition. Now, to give you some examples of some of the national and international recognition for advances, advances in key technology. Next one, please, Bill. Some of you uh, probably can have friends that have been in this situation. The development of technology, these two researchers, the technology uh, on uh, permitting the early detection of Alzheimer's disease. They have now figured out the footprint for Alzheimer's disease. And it's just a matter of going through the protocol testing now so that people earlier in their early stages of Alzheimer's can be tested to see how far along uh, the disease has progressed. And now they're looking for ways to try to regress that disease. Next slide, please. The identification of the virus causing an especially virulent form of skin cancer. And if any of you have ever had skin cancer or know someone who has, you know how debilitating it can be. It can be very frustrating. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the, the development of a vaccine for type 1 diabetes to prevent diabetes. I don't want anybody to raise their hand. <laughs> but if you have diabetes, don't you wish there, there would have been a vaccine to help you prevent from getting diabetes? These two individuals are working on that. And uh, one more slide. And this one I think is really interesting. The most recent news announcing that Pitt researchers received nearly $7 million in federal support over the next three years to test two different types of brain implants designed to advance work that would permit paralyzed individuals. And right now the focus is on the number of veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan with absolutely horrific wounds to their limbs. And, but finding a way through brain implants so that they could control prosthetic limbs through the power of their own thoughts. Right now in the labs in Pittsburgh, there is a monkey who has an implant in its brain. And over here, connected to those wires, are prosthetic arms. And a banana is, and I'm not making this up, folks, the banana is held out to the prosthetic arm. The monkey sees that, and he's thinking, I want it. And the prosthetic arm reaches and grabs the banana. There's another process in place right now for somebody who's visually impaired or declared totally blind. And I never thought, I don't know how you figure these things out, but this is what researchers do. By wearing a camera on a pair of glasses, someone who is blind has a camera right here. And he puts a device that has a wire from the camera. It looks like a lollipop. And you put it in your mouth on your tongue. And the sensory nerves in your tongue communicate the electronic image from the camera to your brain. And I watched a gentleman, a gentleman who is blind, literally walk around the room like this. He's totally blind. He walked around the room through the wing of the chairs and never stumbled once because his brain was seeing what the camera was seeing through a lollipop device sitting on his tongue. Now, he describes the image 
in such a way he, uh, that he said, I can see chairs, I can see human beings, I can't see faces. So the researcher says, and I'm not a techie kind of person, he said, that's about 400 to 500 pixels. Their plan is within a year or two to have it to 24 to 2500 pixels in color. And so someone who's totally lost their vision will be able to wear this device. And now the gentleman who was doing it that day said, the only problem is, when you want to say something, you've got to take it out. He said, as soon as you take it out, you're totally blind. <laughs> so and he had a great sense of humor, so he put it back in. <laughs> Next slide, please. Now, recognizing, you might recognize some of these folks because they're hanging around Squirrel Hill and Shady Side. Recognizing and stopping with these examples might generate misimpressions about our scholarly breadth. But let me say we won high honors by many faculty members in non-biomedical areas such as education, engineering, history, philosophy, and poetry during the past year. Next slide. This is also the case with our junior faculty members who have also won awards based on the high potential of their work and shows that the pit pipeline is full of incredible talent. And some of these people are absolutely incredible. Next slide, please. One of the things that Chancellor Nordenberg is passionate about, absolutely passionate about, is that we on his administrative team will leave the university better than we found it. So that when the next administrative team comes in, that, that person, what's going on here? I was following the instructions up there. <laughs> okay, hold it right there. You're doing a good job. Just hold it right there. So the Chancellor talks about this all the time at our staff meetings. Whatever we do, we're not doing it for our own gratification or our own uh, uh, to get, re get praise reaped upon ourselves. Because any of you know Chancellor Nordenberg, that's not his style. He just says, always, when we leave, we're going to leave this a better place than we found it so that the next administrative team takes over sometime down the road. They can build on that rather than going back and trying to sell it or something. Back in 1995, when Chancellor Nordenberg took over, and it's been my privilege to be working with him now uh, almost two-thirds of, of his tenure as Chancellor, but back in 1995, the university was in big trouble. Financially, it was in very bad shape. And some of you may recall in 1996, that's when Pitt became a state-related university in order to be able to get some funding from the Commonwealth uh, under the structure that, that would reduce tuition costs for in-state students. But it was an important funding stream to be provided to the university to get it back on uh, good financial terms. Today, we're, we're financially in very, very good condition. We're in the middle of a $2 billion capital campaign. We just crossed the last uh, fall, we crossed the $1.5 billion mark. And we're going to raise $2 billion. Now, most of that money is going to specific things. New buildings, endowed scholarships, endowed uh, fellowships, endowed chairs, uh, endowed programs so that it helps the, keep the cost of education down to our, our students, but also attracts the faculty that in turn attracts the students. But one of the things we've been doing over the last number of years, we try to find a way to measure how good we really are. And then you also find out, once you're there, you want to stay there. In terms of measuring overall strength, there's an organization called the Center for Measuring University Performance. It released its first study in 2000. Coincidentally, the same time I came on board, so maybe I can take credit for this meteoric rise to the university. But, and the university quickly embraced these rankings because it relies on nine very measurable objectives. Tied to faculty honors, research strength, graduate and postgraduate uh, programs, undergraduate credentials, fundraising, alumni support, and a number of others that provide this annual study a perspective better than the magazine popularity contest. Everybody's always familiar with the US News and World Report, the best place to go to school. Well, that's based on some, just some very generic metrics. Next slide, please. In 2000, On. All right, so hang on. Talk about that. Double click. Double okay. click to add. Whatever that means. Go get it. There we go. In 2000, we placed in, on the lower left in the fourth cluster. Now, to be in cluster number one, you have to be in the top 25 ranking of the nine categories. So, down in cluster number four, 
that may, meant we were only number one in six of the nine categories. If you're in cluster number three, seven of the nine, cluster number two, eight of the nine, and cluster number one, nine of the nine. But by 2006, we had climbed into, next slide please, uh, let's back up just a second, can you do that? Yes. Okay, we were in cluster four, and you can see the schools there, Georgia Tech, Ohio State, Purdue, Arizona, University of California, Davis, University of California, San Diego, Pitt, and Virginia. All very fine schools. But look at some of the ones ahead of us. Texas A&M, University of California, San Francisco, Iowa, Texas, Penn State, Florida, Illinois, Minnesota, University of Washington, Wisconsin, and then Cluster One, Berkeley, UCLA, Michigan, North Carolina. But by, night, by 2006, in just six years, with a lot of focus, and no hocus pocus, just good hard work. Click. Next slide. We had climbed into cluster number one. And we've been there ever since. And what is especially telling is that we had to improve our position with respect to all those other universities. And I'm going to read them again because when you think about them, first of all, they're from all across the country. And we're talking about the University of Pittsburgh, right here in our own backyard. Arizona, Florida, Georgia Tech, Iowa, Minnesota, Ohio State, Penn State, Purdue, Texas, Texas A&M, University of California at Davis, University of California at San Diego, University of California at San Francisco, University of Virginia, and University of Washington. Those are very, very impressive schools. Fifteen years ago, our students weren't saying, well, I'm thinking of going to Michigan, Ohio State, and maybe uh, Pittsburgh. Now they're saying that. They're comparing us to these other schools. So that was quite a surge that put us into that, next slide please, that put us into that top cluster. Now I want to spend a little time on the economic impact. And then this might be hard to read, so I'll go over some of the things with you. <clears throat> and this is particularly timely, timely because right now the uh, University of Pittsburgh, along with the other state-related universities in Pennsylvania, have just been told uh, by the state administration that if the current budget is passed, uh, Pitt, uh, Penn State, Temple, and Lincoln University are going to take major budget cuts from their state appropriation. For the University of Pittsburgh, it will be $104 million. I'll say that again, $104 million. That's a lot of money to be cut. One of the things that Governor Corbett, he's got a very difficult task in front of him. He's got to try to uh, take care of a $4 billion deficit in the state budget. And so they've gone back and they're trying to find ways to adjust the budget, but we feel that they have disproportionately impacted higher education. And Governor Corbett keeps talking about what his, the role of his administration is going to be jobs, jobs, jobs. And the Chancellor and a number of us have spent a number of days in Harrisburg now talking to the Governor and his staff and the key legislative leadership that Pitt is a generator of jobs. You saw that, $747 million in Research generated over 26,000 jobs. Oh, by the way, I did forget to mention, by end of June this year, the research dollars for this year alone will be 800 million. So that computes to better than 28,000 jobs. We're constantly trying to find space to put the researchers in the impact uh, of what they're doing uh, in the Oakland area and, and uh, renting space wherever we can. But there are 74,000 uh, Pitt alumni living in Allegheny County that generate on a personal income $5.6 billion a year. So those 74,000 Pitt alums are paying property tax, uh, wage tax, things like that. The university alone spends $1.7 billion a year <coughs> in the region. We have $1.3 billion in personal income generated from more than 33,800 Pitt supported jobs, both directly employed, we have about 12,500 with the university, and the rest of the research jobs. We already talked about the 737 million in research funding. People coming to Pitt, parents, just coming to visit, uh, coming for the basketball games, direct and indirect expenditures, uh, roughly 152 million. Now it's interesting when we talk with the restaurant owners along Forbes Avenue when the decision was made to tear down uh, Pitt Stadium and move to uh, uh, Heinz Field. But now with the success of the basketball program 
and 20 some home basketball games, instead of six home football games, they're getting the equivalent of 20 some uh, men's basketball games. And I can assure you, because I'm a, a basketball junkie, both men's and women's, within a couple of years, the women will be playing to sell out Peterson event centers also. And the economic impact of those people coming here to Oakland uh, and also to Squirrel Hill is, is significant. So the last point that I wanted to make on the bottom is we spend on average about $141 million a year on construction. And that's a three-year rolling average, but it's held pretty steady for the last 10 years. That generates more than 1,300 construction jobs. And I'll tell you a little side story about when we were building what was referred to as BST3, the Bioscience Tower, down on Fifth Avenue at the, and I always get the streets, uh, The next one from Lothrop down. Yeah, uh, the key comes up. And now down the key is uh, down. Down. Dara. 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 The corner of Dara and Fifth Avenue. We built that uh, 11 or 12 story research tower. We were having problems with, at that time, uh, the city administration uh, and a couple of mayors ago, we'll just leave it go at that, on getting the building permit because there were some other things that uh, he wanted the uh, university to get involved in and we weren't just really interested in getting involved in. So they literally did not issue a building permit. So what we did is we literally built a skeleton of an 11-story bio-research tower on what we, what's called the foundation permit. And we, we just kept building and building and building. And finally one day, the building inspector came out and said, you can't build this anymore because you don't have your building permit to build the rest of these stories. So we said, okay, I will stop. And so we made a phone call to a gentleman by the name of Rich Denuzzo, who heads up the Pittsburgh uh, Trades Council. He said, Rich, just want to let you know we're closing down the BSD construction project Friday at 5 o'clock. We're laying off 800 construction workers. Steel workers, electricians, lath and plaster, sheet metal workers, operating engineers, we're laying them all off. About a half an hour later, we got a phone call from the city planning guest saying, your permit's available to pick up. <laughs> <laughs> and the point that I'm making here is that we were doing everything by the book, and the city wasn't interested for some reason in giving us the building permit. But the impact of Pitt's construction has been so important to the regional economy. And you can tie UPMC's construction into that same uh, arena and the work that they did, for example, over at Children's Hospital. It's been a major player over the last, uh, I, I checked on this before I left today, I think over the last eight years, a combination of Pitt and UPMC provided almost 80% of the construction projects, excluding the work that was done to build Heinz Field and PNC Park. That includes the Consolidated Center, cons uh, the Console Center. So the construction work that we do is, is very, very important. And so the economic numbers for our home region uh, and what we're doing here. And this is the message we're communicating with Governor Corbett and his staff. We are a job generator. And we're going to do it right. And it's very important for us to continue to maintain the funding we should be getting. Next slide, please. Analysts from all over the country keep coming and looking at Pittsburgh's uh, economic stability with envy. And it's not been a great couple of years anywhere. But it's been a lot less impactful here in Pittsburgh compared to other places across the country. And in virtually every case, these outside reporters and groups that have come in have concluded that this region's single most significant economic asset, as I said earlier in my presentation, is the companion strength that it has in the education and healthcare segment of its economy. Next slide. Michael, this is for you, bud. He was telling me about Cleveland. He said, Cleveland's going one way and we've gone another. In a lengthy Cleveland Plain Dealer article, Dave Burkholz, who used to be here at Pittsburgh uh, with the Heinz Endowments years ago, he's now a Cleveland-based foundation executive, and he was performing here in Pittsburgh, referred to the growing gulf, G-U-L-F, between Pittsburgh and Cleveland in higher education. And he said the big difference is you do not have the equivalent of a pit in Cleveland. Next slide. It's a big engine, according to Harold uh, Miller, it's a big engine, both regionally and nationally, according to Post-Gazette columnist Harold Miller, a highly respected analyst of economic trends, and has confirmed that our region has done much better 
considered a major reason is fully one-fifth of the jobs in the Pittsburgh region are in the two most recession-resistant sectors, healthcare and higher education. Next slide. Becoming more focused on Pitt, just as we worked tirelessly and effectively to forge an impressive record of progress at the university during the past few year, a dozen years with the Chancellor, we're going to continue to work in equally committed ways to protect the products of these efforts by meeting current economic challenges. And I think everybody benefits from what Pitt is doing. Though we obviously wish we were moving through an easier time, and we really thought we were coming out of the economic woes, and then bingo, here comes the state budget situation, but we're going to work through that. We still believe that the months ahead are going to be difficult, but we know that we have a confidence in our record of past uh, accomplishments, and we're going to continue to press forward for even a better pick. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here this evening and talk about the university, and thanks for being such good friends and neighbors of the University of Pittsburgh. It wasn't a historical perspective, it sort of is the pit of today, and I will now entertain any questions that I do have. Uh, i somebody to help pass these out. Sort of a takeaway for you. This is what we send out to uh, uh, prospective students, so that they can get a sense of uh, the pit that they're applying to. While you're passing those out, can Penn State tell Governor Corbett the same story? Parts of it. Parts of it. Um, they can tell a uh, they can tell a, a, a similar research story, but not so much in the biomedical. Uh, but they can still they do a lot of uh, engineering research and uh, business type research out there. They probably can't. Uh, uh, in terms of the uh, construction work, because they haven't done a lot of that over the last number of years uh, compared to what we've done here. Good call. Other questions? First of all, thank you for all your personal stories. It made it very clear and very interesting. Well, if you ever get a blood infection, you want Dr. David Weber. You want Dr. <laughs> David Weber. Not, for, let me just tell you a, a bit more of that little bit of story. Steve's heard this before. When I lived out in Franklin Park in the North Hills, now we moved to Pittsburgh, I and mean, that's another story, because my wife just wanted to, didn't want to have me mowing two acres of grass anymore and raking all the leaves and everything. She, she works part-time at the family house, and she just wanted to get close. And she really wanted to do this, because after we had two very good friends die, three weeks apart, we're driving home from the second funeral, and she said, Rennie, whatever you do, she said, I've never asked for much, but please don't die and leave me in this big house out in Franklin Park all by myself. <laughs> so we built a small, little smaller house over in Somerset, and we love it. We love living in the city. The reason the blood infection was such a major problem for us, I was the mayor of Franklin Park at that time. I was also the fire chief out there for a volunteer fire chief for 18 years. But as mayor, on July 15th, 16th of... Uh, 2005, I was performing the wedding ceremony for my daughter. Four weeks before that wedding, Dr. Weber's telling my wife, we'll know in 24 hours whether he's going to live or not. I did get home. The day before the wedding, I finally unhooked the IV for the last time. I had an IV at home for three weeks on a, what they call it, pick line or something. There's a nurse around, I don't know what they think it's called, pick line or something. But if you see the wedding pictures, Man, there's this decrepit little old guy trying to do that. <laughs> but I made it. So, David Weber. All right, but there was a question to yes. follow that. Yes. And that is, with these wonderful discoveries like the blind man, yes. how close are they to general usage? Well, I think we're going to see those come out very quickly. And, and one <coughs> of the reasons why uh, is, it's sort of a sad commentary, but it's the way things happen. With so many military personnel coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, there's an interest by the federal government to accelerate all this research. And when you go down to the McGowan Center on the south side and see some of the work that they're doing down there, uh, they have a doctor who, if they showed a little boy who had lost one or two fingers of his little hand, and through uh, his research, they've been able to regenerate the, uh, the digits. The same way, uh, what is it, a salamander can regrow? Re 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 they've been able to uh, generate digits. They show how, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been burned and had to have a skin graft. I understand it's one of the most painfully horrific things you can go through. There's a new process now. It's like when they seed your lawn, when they spray the stuff on your lawn, they actually seed your burn. They spray this, and when it heals up, 
Uh, we had Admiral Mike Mullen, who's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, visiting us last uh, April, this past April, a year ago. And a gentleman walked up to him and shook his hand, and he was a corporal, I believe, from the Marines. And uh, Admiral Mullen said, Corporal, it's nice to meet you, sir. And he says, nice to meet you too, sir. He said, what were your injuries? And he said, I was burned over 80% of my body. And the Admiral's eyes got as big as saucers, and he said, where? <laughs> because there is no, on a graph, there's a very definite scar of mine on this seeding process. So I was, it's almost like hydro seeding, and your doctor has figured out how to do that. There's a cow walking down around there with an artificial heart the size of a softball. She's just walking around all day having a good old time. Someday, this doctor believes, this researcher believes that if you have a heart attack, the protocol will be they will take your heart out, they will put this small pump in your heart, in your body, not hooked up with anything, you walk around, they'll take your heart and put it in a laboratory and through stem cell research, the heart is one of the, bless you, sir, the heart is one of the organs that will regenerate itself. You know, if you donate half of your liver, It'll regenerate back. Well, the heart will regenerate itself. So if you have damaged valves or a damaged wall of the heart, they can cut it out, and then through stem cell research, the heart will regrow, and then once it's <coughs> healthy and they keep it nourished, they'll just open you up, put your heart back in, and take your... And I believe that's going to happen for probably in the next five to ten years. So people are going to live to what? <laughs> well, that's, you know, and I, my dear mother's gone now, and she had, I can remember when she was 87, she had quadruple bypass surgery, and the doctor walked in and said, Sarah, I got good news and bad news. And she says, well, what's the, bad, uh, the good news? And he said, your heart's as healthy as a 40-year-old. And he says, what's the bad news? He says, you're not going to die from a heart attack. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, she did. She died from pancreatic, pancreatic cancer a few years later. But that's one of the issues that other researchers are looking at, the whole concept of aging. And what does that mean? And what good is it if someone is 95 or 100 years old as a, a heart of somebody who's a 40-year-old, but does not either have the mental capacity or the physical uh, strength to, to, do, to live a quality life? So I think we're li living in some very interesting times. And, uh, but the good news is I wouldn't want to be any other place in the country with that. You name the owners. I would much rather be here in Pittsburgh because the specialists that are all around uh, the university and with the uh, Hillman Cancer Center, it's a it's a phenomenal place to if you have the illness. Yes, sir. Are we going to get the vaccination plant here? Well, I hope so, um, <laughs> because we're talking. It can be at least a thousand jobs. Uh, it's uh, been up on the list for state funding and for also NIH funding. Uh, the current plan for that is probably uh, one site would be down on the old LTV site down in Hazelwood, which I think would be a great economic boost to that area. And it's, as they say, it's in the queue, uh, if, whether that happens or not. But again, and again, this is just Rennie Clark speculating here, but if all of a sudden we had a, a strain of some type of flu that became a pandemic, that plant would be up and running tomorrow. Now, it takes a while to, to develop the uh, uh, the vaccines and everything. But it ties into a lot of other resources. I heard a story the other day in Harrisburg about a uh, vaccine plant up in Lycoming County that buys a million eggs a week from the farmers down in Lancaster County. And so this legislator was making the point in favor of higher education and research and all the things we do because he said if it wasn't for uh, this uh, uh, vaccine plant that's affiliated with, I think it's with the University of Pennsylvania, being there, the farmers in Lancaster wouldn't have this steady market of selling a million eggs a week to this vaccine plant where they do the flu vaccines and stuff. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we have also another excellent university. Of course, I'm talking about CMU, and they are just about numbers number one in uh, computer science. Absolutely. And uh, the, um, that robot that... The we, robotic center, yes. Uh, uh, oh, no, the one that just won. The oh, the uh, robotic competition. No, right. yeah, I forget his name. name. I forget. Watson. 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 The computer, Watson. right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, CMU was involved with yep. uh, putting that together. 
and they have been talking about the possibility of using that capability in some area of Medicaid medicine. Right. Are you, are the both of you working? Yes, we are. In fact, there, there were some pit folks that worked on the Watson Project. Uh, CMU had to leave, but there were some pit uh, faculty members that worked on the Watson Project. That, uh, uh, and it's really a, a, an incredibly super fast computer. Pitt and CMU have worked together on so many initiatives over, year, over the years, the Digital Greenhouse, the Life Sciences Greenhouse, and uh, if you ever saw two uh, people that are so, um, like two he's in a plot, it's uh, Dr. Jerry Cohen and Chancellor Mark Woodenberg, and how they work together on initiatives. Uh, very, very supportive of each other. And we're really blessed to have a number of other fine universities here in, in the Pittsburgh, with yes. Carlo and Chatham and Point Park and Duquesne. Indeed. And all of them have their values. I'm here tonight because they don't pay me. Pitt does. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the Post-Gazette had uh, an article about four uh, or five months ago dealing with the relationship between you, Pitt, and CMU. Yes. And how they are working together. Yes. So I was wondering. We work on a number of, number of projects together now in the biomedical area also. And I want to generate a little conversation for a minute. You worked at Westinghouse. Yes. You worked at Westinghouse. <laughs> Where? I was the manager of the research library. Oh, uh, the research lab? Yes. Oh, library. Oh, pardon? Library. The, yes, but it was at, at Churchill. Church. Oh, okay. At Churchill. Yeah. Right. That was another one of the things I snuck through before I was finally gone. I got that name to George Westinghouse Research Park. But the new owners might change the name of it, unfortunately. I tried, but... Well, that's great. Any other old Westinghouse folks around? <clears throat> What percentage of uh, Pitt's annual budget is tuition? And what's going to happen with tuition? <coughs> it's a negative effect from the Pennsylvania State Government. Good question. Uh, the uh, percent of the budget is uh, tuition. The education component is about um, of a $1.9 billion budget. It's about $800, $900 million. Yeah. Uh, the that's the education problem, both undergraduate and, and graduate. We don't know what's going to happen with tuition yet. Obviously, uh, the Chancellor is very concerned about that and has publicly said we do not want to have the, the students bear the total uh, impact of this tuition. Uh, if there has to be a tuition increase that, uh, to cover the loss of funding. So we're looking at a lot of different possibilities right now. Uh, we, we still don't know what the final number is. We've had some excellent meetings in Harrisburg, we've recently, uh, received some encouragement. I don't think it'll get fully re uh, restored, but uh, I think a significant amount of it will get restored. But the tough part about it, the governor is absolutely locked in that he's not going to spend more than $27.3 billion. Uh, he's just not going to do that. And I think as private citizens, we have to be respectful. He's trying to bring a balanced budget back in that is based on the revenue that's there. And so he's going to have to shift some money around a little bit. And so it's going to be an interesting next four to six weeks of uh, figuring out what we're going to do. Um, Penn State, for example, has already announced they're going to have a pay freeze. Uh, we had a pay freeze a year before last. That's very difficult for employees to accept and also when you're trying to retain really quality faculty and staff because uh, even though there might not be jobs right here in the Pittsburgh area, we did lose some very good uh, faculty uh, in the last couple of years because of the uh, uh, salary situation to other very fine institutions in other states. Right now we're going through an interesting uh, process across the United States of what is the value of education and, and how and, and what do we want to uh, what are we want to pay for it. I could get really up on a soapbox here because I get passionate about it. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in democracy. And I, I'm a firm believer that one of the core elements of democracy is public education. I think that is a, a sovereign right of anybody who lives in this country. And I firmly believe, and I've always believed this, my kids went to North Allegheny. We moved out there because we wanted to move in a sleepy little town called Franklin Park. We moved out there. There were 2,000 people. When we left, there was 15,000. It was starting to get a little crowded. So I moved into the city, but that's okay. <laughs> but I don't think there's any difference. I really believe this. I don't think there's any difference between a kid who's going to Ingemar Elementary School out in Franklin Park and the kid who's going to Colfax School up on Beachwood Boulevard or going to uh, Westinghouse High School. 
I think the, the, differenti the differentiator is what is offered to them in the forms of the quality of education. And so I am absolutely passionate about, uh, we've got to step back and say, what do we want to invest in education because it's our future. Uh, and we can do all the things and most of us around this room, when I look around the room, we've, we're over the hill in a lot of ways, and, but we've got to take care of these kids. And so it's going to be interesting, an, an interesting uh, dilemma down in Harrisburg for legislators too. It's a question back here, ma'am. Oh, just a real quick, quick thank you. I'm a member of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Oh, great. And um, it's just fabulous to be part of campus life, and I wanted to thank you for supporting the program and especially the opportunity for people over 50 to audit classes. It's very special. And, uh, you know, I, I, am obviously amazed. We're I am amazed at the number of uh, senior citizens that you'll see come in and, uh, and audit the class, and, uh, and some of them really get passionate about it. I uh, ran into two uh, individuals last spring, I guess it was, and they were having this big debate about were they going to get their paper done in time? And I, I said, aren't you just auditing the class? And this guy said, young man, I want to show those young whippersnappers that I know how to do a paper, and I want to get an A on it. <laughs> so that's good. And I, and I enjoy being around the students. Uh, it's, uh, I'm 68 years old, but I, I love being around the kids. They have a vitality to them, and uh, yet they have a naiveness that they... But that's good. Mm -hmm. And that's, we went through that when we were young. So. Do you have a question over there? Well, this was a real estate question. Is it true that you're going to leave the area above Fifth where you're doing the demolition around the old children's hospital area? Um, is that going to be open space for a while? That's, uh, that's going to be open space. It actually belongs to UPMC. That's the part of the children's hospital they're tearing down. Uh -huh. And uh, UPMC has decided to just make that a, a green space for a while uh, till they decide what would, would serve them in their, in their best interest. So. I think that for a period of time we're going to have a nice open area there, and every little green space you can get around Oakland is uh, is very it's mm -hmm. encouraging. And uh, uh, but again, um, that land is so important and so and it's contiguous to the rest of the UPMC facility, depending on what their needs are. Now we at the university are going to build a new dormitory on Fifth Avenue at Fifth Avenue at uh, right across the. Uh, Oakland Avenue from the uh, our, our University Place, I'm sorry, uh, from Soldiers and Sailors. There's a parking lot right in the corner of Fifth and University Place, and then there's a small building called the Physician's Building. That's going to be torn down, and there's an 11 story dormitory going to go up there uh, to go uh, house about 500 students. Part of that is our commitment to the community. We want to try to, uh, at some point in time, get to the point where we can. Sure, an incoming freshman that he or she can have a room on campus all four years. Right now, we can't do that. We can only guarantee them three. So, with the expansion in Bouquet Gardens, with the expansion of this dorm, with the dorms that we built up on this uh, top of the rim of the old Pitt Stadium, we've uh, will have extracted about uh, 2,000 students that used to rent uh, in the Oakland community. And uh, what we're trying to do is work with. Uh, there are some very good landlords in, in Oakland. Uh, that uh, we have a high, very high comfort level of our students coming from. There are some other landlords that uh, you just, you know, you wonder, the kids must have gone in there with the blinders on when they signed the lease. Uh, so one of the ways that we can make an impact is if we can reduce the amount of students that are available to the rental market. We're hoping that the uh, those that have rental properties will make them more competitive and have them to look better. So, And there's more housing going to open up now up on Oak Hill, the old Alapopa Terrace site. There's some more townhouses and apartment buildings up there, and some of it is going to be uh, what they call market housing, and the students have uh, uh, sort of moved into Oak Hill, too. They enjoy being over there. I have a question. Yes. Go over for a few minutes the mess that had to be fixed back when some state funding came in. What, what were the crises that the university faced? Well, at, at the time, uh, in 1995, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 1965 and 66, uh, the university had just literally not paid attention to its financial books, and there, there wasn't any misdeeds. They just weren't watching the revenue stream coming in and how much they were spending. And uh, it became very apparent that uh, the university was going to have significant financial problems. And at that time, uh, a gentleman by the name of Kaylee Royers was in the House of uh, Representatives. And, uh, 
Uh, I met Mr. Irvis a few years ago uh, before his, uh, his death, and uh, just an incredible individual. Uh, he was the first African American speaker of the House uh, uh, in, uh, in the North uh, since the Civil War. But he had such a passion for Pitt. He was a Pitt uh, graduate, and he, he was a visionary. Uh, he saw the value of Pitt to the city of Pittsburgh, and he knew that it could not uh, be, uh, uh, fall apart. Be, be let to fall apart. At the same time, uh, Wesley Possoir came in as a chancellor, and uh, West had a vision to grow the research side of Pitt and really to move it forward. So they came up with the idea of Pitt and Temple becoming public research universities and getting funding. And the premise was, and it still holds true today, is that at, uh, when that would take place, that a student coming from Pennsylvania would pay half the tuition that an out-of-state student would pay. And that actually started to build the, uh, uh, the enrollment base. The application started coming in a little bit stronger. And it also uh, uh, started to attract uh, the uh, growth of the school uh, and the quality of some of the programs out of state students. So they, they both sort of went hand in hand. Over the last 45 years, the university has honored that commitment of trying to uh, offer uh, the tuition about half of what the in-state, today in-state students about $22,000 for the College of Arts and Sciences and a, uh, a state students $14,000. So it's not quite half anymore, but it's close to it. And uh, part of that is comes through because funding comes from the endowment to help with uh, student scholarships uh, and, and building the endowment so that it another goal that the chancellor has, has focused on. So there were a number of things. And they hadn't looked at their physical plant either. They had just let the physical plant Go to, go to ruin, and uh, a lot of that $140 million a year that we spent on construction has been renovated, renovation of existing buildings, maintaining the architectural character of those buildings, but at the same time, uh, bringing them up to the standards for the a 21st century researcher needs to have for his or her work. Yes, Mary. One more no, that's okay. Those of us who have been around Oakland for a very long time, you were talking about housing for students, yes. have felt that the university could be a little stronger on controlling those landlords who have used and wish that you would and also that we wish you would help the housing. We have nothing to do with housing. Um, for staff, it would be nice to have staff be able to live in Oakland and have decent housing. Right. And so far, um, I do think that's important. Well, we, and we do know, and we, I do agree with you, and we have worked with, along with Oakland Planning Development Corporation. They've been doing uh, a number of initiatives on uh, housing and renovating some housing. Oh, yeah, but that... But, so there's, that, but for, there's some staff folks that have bought some of those houses now. Well, that, yeah, but they, they don't have the funds they don't have to do the, it don't in have the, the amount of right. time or need to exist. Now, the problem with us certifying or not certifying landlords becomes a very particularly You can do it with that. the city, but the city hasn't moved fast enough. Well, we, we keep pushing them, because well, what, what she's saying is, why doesn't Pitt just say, you can rent from him because all his units meet the, these standards, but you no, can't? No, and you can, you can ask the city for standards Do we have the standards? Oakland. We just keep, we keep pushing the inspectors to well, go after Well, they're not being fulfilled. I can't go down that road. <laughs> and I'm a city resident now, too, so you don't want to get me on that. We're going to the Somerset and they take the bus away, so I'm not happy about that right now. But we, what we do do is we do list the landlords that, uh, through uh, our housing people, go out and inspect the properties. And they'll say that, and uh, with all due respect, if there's any lawyers in the room, I do have my total respect, but the lawyers are saying you cannot say we verify that this place is absolutely perfectly safe. You can the say, city can. The city can. But you can. When we're doing that, but we can't get them to come out here to do that. And every once in a while they come out and they want to make a sweep of Oakland and then they get the picture taken and then they go away. That's right. Okay, thank you. We're on the same boat, my dear. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody?
last question. Thank you very much. <laughs> There's a senior project just on the, uh, above Noah Arena, which is named after him. I found myself there this afternoon and we were doing a rent study for that project and I delivered it today. Interesting to hear his name. Uh, thanks again. You don't have to rush out of here. Look at the literature in the back. We'll see you in May.